Well, I'm at the Red House with Martha Bassett, and thank you for joining me and for doing this. You're very welcome. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Well, uh, <laughs> it's it's only the right thing since you just recently had me I know. <laughs> on your show. Uh, Turnabout. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So your show, the Martha Bassett Show, is uh, honest to God, one of the the most positive, I think, musical <gasps> experiences I've had in maybe, honest to God, maybe my entire career thus far. Wow. Like, it's... It, it's so, it can be so, with music, with like being an artist and having your name attached to things, sometimes there's this temptation to want to have control mm. and to want to be like, oh, you know, am I, I'm just going to walk into an environment and play with people I don't know and play mm-hmm. with, play on a stage I haven't played on it and like all this, all these unknown factors. Right. And you can imagine how all of that could go really badly, but mm-hmm. with your show, all of it really went perfectly everybody's so easy to play with and the mix of it all with all these opportunities to to collaborate with people was all super like uh like an that's just done in a positive and artistic uh, in a way that maintained artistic integrity and i just really appreciated that whole thing thank you that's so good to hear that's what we're, we're aiming for and everybody comes at the show from you know a different place and we're, we're trying to make it positive and uh happy for everyone yeah well it was so, for me anyway good good what was the like what what's the origin story of this thing how did this idea come to be well um about seven or eight years ago when um chris and debbie groner uh bought the the reeves which was in great disrepair at the time um i had known debbie and she took me to lunch and said, would you like to think about doing something regular once we have this space renovated and we're up and running? And um, so my partner, Pat Lawrence, and I started thinking about that. Uh, and of course, I was thinking, maybe I'll do an open mic night or something like that. And Pat is a much larger thinker. And he was like, no, we're going to do the Martha Bassett show. <laughs> and I was like, no, we're not. That's horrible. <laughs> and... Uh, he wore me down, and here we are. <laughs> but um, I will say that it has been an evolution since the beginning. We we had our our sights set for radio. Mm. Um, from you know, we wanted to be like Prairie Home Companion, mm-hmm. and so we just started off with that uh, with that model. Not exactly the same model as them, but we. Uh, we actually did consult with um, one of the uh, Prairie Home producers and got a lot of great advice on uh, uh, the flow of, that's cool. of everything. And, and we've just really been putting together a team ever since. And I, I, that's really what this is all about. My part of it is um, it's just one little, little piece but we have a, a great team that has stuck with us all these years. We're just uh, almost at the end of our fifth season right now, and we've learned so much. And uh, we finally made it to radio. It took us three years to make it to radio. Mm-hmm. So. What has been some of the big changes you've seen, I guess, from the first season to now? Um, really, I didn't have the nerve to come in to like national artists who were coming to our stage and say, you're going to do three songs here. I felt like I needed to get out of their way and let them do their thing. But then that just makes us like any other show. Mm -hmm. So um, it was really taking control of the form. Mm. And I found in every instance, everybody was cool with that. They, and I always send the show flow in advance so that people can see where they fit in and hopefully it helps them decide how they're going to do their programming. And sometimes, um, as you know, I know exactly what songs they're going to do because we are, um, augmenting them. And sometimes they're on the stage by themselves or with their own ensemble. And I just get out of the way. Yeah. That's interesting to hear you say that the, so you're all you've been an artist for a minute and like that you're comfortable in that territory I'm sure was it just what was what was difficult about switching to this role where you're kind of directing the shots and stuff the talking the talking has been the hard part it's still the hard part um, talking on stage yeah 
Mm. Yeah, just introducing people and interviewing people. I'm a lot more comfortable with it than I used to be, but I'm always... I always walk off the stage and I'm a little horrified <laughs> that I was so awkward or that I said the wrong thing or I stumbled over my words or I don't know. Yeah, I can understand. Uh, Singing is, is so much easier. Uh, you know, yeah. people find that hard to believe, but it, you're, you know what you're doing. You're rehearsed when you're doing your music. and. That is interesting to think about. Yes. Uh, I mean, public speaking, that's like, you know, a lot of people's number one fear in life is public yeah, speaking. For sure. And you you relate to that? Absolutely. <laughs> and then you got a radio show with your name I on know. it. <laughs> you I know. I know. That's great. I mean, that sounds <laughs> honestly almost like a sort of, what, like cathartic thing to do, like to challenge yourself in that way. I like to do scary things. Um, not all scary things, but I, I do uh, tend to um, figure out where I'm uncomfortable and push into that a little bit. Mm -hmm. So this is one of those things for sure. Have you always been that way? Yeah, I think so. I roller think so. coaster rides and such? Love roller coasters. <laughs> okay. I don't know. It's been a little while since I've been on one. but. So, okay. So let's talk a bit about we, where we left off, I think, and when I was in Elk. And I'd like to hear more about just like your whole, uh, the road you've traveled down as an artist. And maybe, maybe we can start with where that started. We can start as far back as you want. Well, I was a little <laughs> child in West Virginia. <laughs> Singing to the cows. <laughs> Hell yeah. <laughs> I was. <laughs> That's cool. <laughs> I lived out in the middle of nowhere. My mom loved music and always had music going in the house. And um, and I was a low-voiced child. Mm. Um, so I always felt like I wasn't a good singer because I couldn't sing the same notes as Linda Ronstadt or Olivia Newton-John. They were a little higher than me. and. Huh. Uh, so I stood by my grandma in the church choir and sang alto and I just developed an ear for harmony singing and it's still my favorite thing to do. And I don't get to do that in my own band, but on the show, I get to do it really regularly. So mm -hmm. I, I love, um, having that opportunity to sing more harmonies, but I, um, I always wanted to be a singer and, didn't really know that I could. My um, first instrument was piano, and I loved piano, and I practiced all the time, and uh, never was terribly good, but I loved the sitting down and working out the mechanics of music and reading music and chord structures, and I had a great piano teacher who um, gave me a, a great base of that. She was kind of a country honky-tonk church pianist and hell yeah yeah <laughs> so um that was probably the best education i could have gotten earlier yep and then saxophone in junior high and um and it was really late junior high early high school i, I realized that i could sing in a classical voice mm. and um so i just went straight for that and that's that's what i was interested in uh up until my late 20s, about 30, I, I joined my first band and uh, did that very scary thing, which was to sing in this other voice that. Yeah, it is a different. Was voice. not classical. <laughs> yeah. So. There's a lot there. Let's see. <laughs> did you literally sing to cows? Yeah, I did. <laughs> <laughs> How did they take it? Oh, they're the best audience because they just look at you, <laughs> you know. They shut up. They shut they up. They respect the they music. They just turn yeah. around and look at you. And <laughs> yeah, I wish more people could take that <laughs> take that hint. <laughs> um, okay. Okay. <laughs> Did I stump you? I'm sorry. <laughs> no, you're great. Um, you played saxophone when. Um, seventh grade through, um, I didn't quite go all the way through high school with it, but it was my band instrument. I can't picture that <laughs> <laughs> for some reason. I know me neither. I, I wish I still had my sax. I stupidly sold it. Do you like, do you, would you still, if you, if you, if you had your sax, would you be able to like jump on it and kind of, no, I'm so out of practice with that. And, um, it was not my favorite thing to do. I loved piano a lot more than sax. And do you still play piano? 
Um, only when I'm doing uh, teaching voice lessons or something I, I, to support other people, but I've never really performed on piano. Gotcha. All right, so classical singing. Yes. Up against every man singing or whatever you want to call it, up against rock singing, up against mm-hmm. uh, pop music singing. Like, maybe you can describe the difference of those two worlds and what that was like to navigate from one to the other. Yeah, the um, the difference is uh, classical singing is up in your head voice, so it's uh, I don't want to do it in this microphone. So. <laughs> <laughs> but um, it um, it is very physical in a way that just regular singing, not that that's not physical, but it really does take your whole body, and it uh, it is something that I could go into a practice room and do all day and. Mm. Um, I loved the uh, learning the repertoire. I mean, the, it's just huge. Uh, the varieties of style that you can sing, and um, I loved competing when I was younger. I was uh, that was another thing that was really scary for me. I had a lot of performance anxiety, so I tried to compete a lot, and that helped with that some. Um, I was never super into opera, and I think that's because I'm, I don't, acting is not very comfortable for me. I've, mm. I've done a little bit of music theater and opera, but mostly in school. And um, one of my favorite things is choral music. So I was in the Belcanto Company for a few years. That's a professional chorus in Greensboro. And I love the feeling of being in. Uh, a section and creating one voice from eight voices and right. ha- having a sound and just the uh, the nuance that a choir can sure accomplish yeah so that there's that world and then what what ultimately I think drove you to take a step out of that world and into this world where you weren't in that section full of voices anymore well um I had always you know had a had a few jazz standards in my pocket as a party trick for choir parties because <laughs> that was something that I could do that not everybody could do. <laughs> sure. <laughs> uh, but I didn't really uh, consider it, you know, a path to take. Um, I was visiting a friend in Greensboro one day and her husband and some neighborhood friends were um, having like a, a jam with like old standards and swing tunes. And they're like, you're a singer, come and sing one. And um, gosh, I can't even remember what I did. Probably something like All of Me or, you know, something really standard because I didn't know that many songs then. And uh, they kept inviting me back. that jam started being more honed and we started working on things with three-part harmonies which i love and it became the swing band martha and the mood swingers Mm, that's a great name (laughs) jim carson the guitar player in that band he uh he named us (laughs) it's a good name (laughs) yeah and we worked a lot and it was terrifying to stand up i always felt like i'm making a fool of myself because I'm singing in this voice that is not what I trained, and hmm. I don't know if it's any good, and I don't know. Uh, but I worked through that. You just do it long enough, and what I always tell um, students is you just have to stand up and suck in front of other people enough times to where you realize it doesn't matter, it's okay. Yeah. Pe- people... Um, just want a good vibe music. They're they're not listening to every tiny, minute mistake that I'm making, or I or what I true. consider a mistake. Yeah, I think that's that's spot on. But so, it seems like such a shift in perspective. I would think because these mm-hmm. traditions, I would think of as like, I mean, kind of like there was something subtle in what you just said, like like the difference in standing up and feeling sort of silly versus this thing that you were trained in and like not knowing if the thing that you felt silly doing was good or not. Right. And it seems like, I guess in my mind, when I hear that, I, of course a bias could be feeding into this, but like, uh, 
what I hear is sort of the difference between this tried and true, like very proven method yeah, versus this sort of surprising, like unproven method that's a little bit more, I guess I'm, I guess I think of like our approach to popular music or whatever, or, or common music as a little bit maybe more individualized perhaps compared to something that's as as proven yeah. as as uh, classical or whatever. Mm-hmm. That's a very good way to put it because I still don't have a sense of uh, how good my music is. Mm. Or uh, and I'm I'm talking about my voice really. Um, um, I've had to kind of let go of the idea of it being good and instead just try and it sounds so cliche but to do something that reaches people and the only way you can do that is if you just feel your way through it Mm -hmm. you know what I mean Mm -hmm. so um, sometimes my voice will crack I won't be completely in tune but if there's a spirit in the music that um, (laughs) reaches people that's actually better than the perfect performance and that's where uh, I think that's where recordings can go very sterile and I think I've been guilty of of that of really trying to perfect things too much oh interesting because perform I mean uh, recordings they're forever you know if you just can't let that go. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. But, of course, you can. You can. <laughs> you can. <laughs> yeah. We, some of us do it all the time. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, I mean, I get it. It is forever. Or, you right. Know, it's going to – you want it to be something that you could stand beside forever. And yeah. And you hope it's forever. And so you want that thing to be as good as it can be. There's a lot of different approaches to recording, and some people just don't give a damn, and they just let it be really loose, and some people really mm-hmm. tighten it up and – Who's to say? I think it all just depends on what you want, but it sounds like you are saying that level of connection you want to have maybe isn't best supported by whatever, being too overly nitpicky. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. I've been in uh, bands that were super tight, and there's something exciting about that precision, and I love that. Mm-hmm. And uh, But it, it can get too tight. And now I'm in the situation where I have people like you on the show and you come in and you are honed, you are doing your thing and it sounds great. And um, I am the week of the show going, okay, what song have I not done? And, And trying to like figure out something new really quickly. And so I always feel like, um, I'm just barely hanging on and, and I'm on a stage with people who are bringing their A game. <laughs> but it's kind of, uh, it's fun too. Yeah. It's fun too. I, I've learned to love that. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> it's very interesting to hear you talk about that stuff and about the navigating those worlds. And yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. From the outside, looking at classical music, I guess there is this whole thing. Like when you're talking about singing with your whole body, mm-hmm. it's like, that's all that's all alien to me that's all like it, all, all approaches to music that are classical and proven are alien to me everything i've done has just been because it was around and because mm-hmm. me and a bunch of sweaty guys <laughs> figured out how to do it around one another and that was kind of it um so i don't know techniques and so when i hear something like oh yeah i learned how to sing with my whole body i'm like i don't know how you, i don't know how you even think about all of that and uh, I don't know. So it's just really interesting to hear to hear some of those differences kind of peppered into the conversation. Mm. Um, so here's a question uh, that I hope isn't weird. To, you you seem like one of the happier... You seem like... You seem very happy mm-hmm. when you're doing music. And like you're one of the few people I ever see really genuinely smile mm. as you do it. And... It's interesting because you're describing all these things like I'm barely hanging on by a thread. <laughs> I like I'm very it's just un- embarrassment. <laughs> Smiles. <laughs> no, sometimes I'm very happy, but sometimes I'm just like, oh. <laughs> you seem so happy. Like you seem like you have this really positive relationship with music, and uh, it's interesting to hear you say all this stuff. Like it sounds like a nightmare, but <laughs> but a good one. It's not a nightmare. I. Uh, 
That's I, good. I'm not struggling. I, I used to struggle a lot more. I would, uh, especially in the early days of the Mood Swingers, uh, for three days before a gig, I would just be so nervous. And then for three days afterwards, I would be like, oh, I made such a fool of myself. Mm. <laughs> and, but, uh, you know, I'm older now. <laughs> You just have to get get through that if you're going to do this for a living. And um, uh, you just have to respect how everybody stands up and does their thing. I am amazed that so many young people now, um, you see children and teenagers and, you know, people in their young, in their early 20s who, uh, who just seem to have such poise and confidence. Mm. And uh, that amazes me because I was not like that as a kid. You know, I was, I was performing, but um, I, I know I didn't have that poise, and I know I didn't have a polished sound like that. It took me years to develop what I've got. Mm. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm happy when I'm performing, and I really um, – I'm – kind of an introvert. So, um, I love talking one-on-one -on -one with people. Yeah. Whereas speaking in front of a crowd is a little, little scary for me, but, um, I don't know. There's something about, um, like I, I love being at a party where I'm performing. Not that I need everybody to look at me. I just have my role. Mm -hmm. I have a comfortable, um, thing to do instead of awkwardly making conversation with with people and that's interesting yeah one of those is very uh unpredictable and one of those is not right right do you like the predictable yes i do of course i see <laughs> <laughs> i mean it's comfortable yeah yeah i like to uh I like to have a job in the situation, you know? <laughs> I totally, I, I've never <laughs> thought about it in those terms, but I 100% relate to that. Yeah. And sometimes when the party's over, I'm like, I feel like, okay, my job is done. God right. damn it. Like I'm, I should leave now <laughs> kind right. of thing. Exactly. I know what you mean. Like if I was at home having a dinner party, I would probably be running around um, taking care of the food and yeah. finding another job <laughs> rather than holding court with <laughs> conversation. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I like the conversation part too, you know, uh, but I do know the distinction you're making for sure. I mm -hmm. do feel like I have two personalities I can use in these situations. And yeah. one of them is that guy who's like a schmoozer and one of them is the other thing. Mm -hmm. uh, but yet yeah, also like, like in situations like that, even like on the show, when asked a question to talk, it's, it's almost like, lightning bolts going off it's like I, I i say so much and i say it so fast and i don't know what i've said after uh -huh. i said it kind of thing yeah it's like a weird rush of like blah, 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 and then it's over it's kind of a it's like what did i just say you know right and uh i have taken a lot of comfort in knowing that those shows are going to be edited for radio. So if I say something stupid, it's gone. Nice. <laughs> and same for you. <laughs> That's good. If I mess something up, if I mess up a song, whatever. Yeah. Um, yeah. Pat is going to make it pretty for radio. Mm -hmm. Cool. So I'm, and this is great. I'm getting to like kind of <laughs> learn a bit about your personality and stuff. <laughs> um, this is awesome. So, this is going to be a vague question. I hope that okay. it isn't like too whatever uh, vague, but you know, it's all, it's always <laughs> like uh, fun to hear about people's journeys through the arts, but like, but why, like why the arts for you? I think like, what does it do? What is it for? You know, all this stuff that we do. You know, I've just never, that's an interesting question. I've just never done or, considered doing anything else. I mean, I, uh, I've certainly had other jobs kind of working myself through school. I was, uh, a secretary in lots of different situations getting through college and, uh, and for two hellish years, um, after grad school, I thought I'm gonna, I have to take this job in a bank to make some money, mm. which was just awful. But, uh, I really value that experience because I was like, 
what am I doing? I'm a musician. <laughs> and as soon as I uh, quit the bad banking job, which did not make that much money, um, I immediately made more money in music. And of course I was doing, it was piecemeal. I was teaching and I was performing and I was, uh, you know, working in four different music schools. Mm -hmm. But uh, it, I don't know. I've, I've just kind of always known that I was a musician. I j it just took me a while to figure out what my instrument was, if that makes any sense. For sure. Um, and when you say that, I guess you mean your instrument is singing. Yes. Yeah. I love playing guitar. I will never uh, be a world-class guitar <laughs> player, you know, um, or any other instrument. But I love uh, I loved playing bass for a while, and I um, that was super fun for me. But, um, yeah, I just feel like uh, voice is my main means of expression. Mm-hmm. I'm with you. I mean, I, I love learning different instruments, but really if I, if I can't sing songs that I write, if I, for me, probably the most important thing is songwriting, but if uh -huh. I'm not performing those songs, yeah, the instrument stuff is kind of, it almost is in vain or it's almost like it just doesn't have a proper purpose if it isn't part of a song. You mm -hmm. know? Yeah, I know what you mean. Um, I don't feel the same way about songwriting. I've written some songs. Mm. But it is not my my main thing. You're kind of a song curator, it seems. Yeah, yeah. I love songs. I'm just as happy, if not more happy, singing other people's songs than I am my own. I'm always a little embarrassed by my songs, but um, you know, I've written some nice songs. Well, I've listened through your <laughs> CDs, and I like your songs. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Songs. Let's talk about this a little. I mean. Okay, so recently I saw a clip of you singing a song in a different language. Maybe, was it Portuguese? It was Portuguese. Are you bilingual? By the I am not yet, but I'm working on it. I am uh, trying to learn Portuguese. I, that was sort of a pandemic project, uh -huh. and it started because I've always loved bossa novas and wanted to sing them but felt like they didn't sound so great in English, which makes sense most music sounds best in the native tongue. But uh, Portuguese is really hard, and I didn't know, you don't learn that in school. You don't even learn Spanish when you major in voice. It's like German, French, Latin, Italian. Uh. And uh, so you don't really get any of that flavor. So I found somebody um, in Winston who had been in the Peace Corps in Brazil, and he helped me with diction for, I thought, well, I'm going to learn Girl from Ipanema as a party trick so that I can stand up and sing it in Portuguese mm -hmm. at an open mic or whatever. <laughs> and uh, once I put that much work into that one song, I was like, well, I really want to learn bossa nova guitar style. So Colin Alured uh, took me on as a guitar student mm. and we did Zoom lessons all during the pandemic and he helped me so much. And uh, then my Portuguese teacher said, well, I've kind of taught you all I can teach you. I'm going to hand you off to an actual Brazilian. Mm. <laughs> and she um, has been amazing. She's still working with me. And so I'm, I'm not fluent, but I can carry on conversations. She says I speak like a child, but everybody will understand what I'm saying. That's, that's where you start. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah, I think I, I heard once from, from some speakers some Spanish friends, some Hispanic friends that uh, there's phona or whatever within Portuguese that you kind of lose the ability to hear at a certain point and, and stuff. Um, is that like, are, so are you able to kind of actually get dig into it and like notice the, di these little distinctions between it and Spanish? Oh yeah. They, they sound totally different. Yeah. And from what I understand, I don't speak Spanish. So from what I understand, um, Portuguese speakers can understand Spanish speakers pretty well, but right. not the other way around. Right. I think that's where that phone and stuff comes in. If yeah, there's so much more uh, nasal vowels, and um, since I don't know Spanish, I, I'm not going to be able to speak intelligently on this. But yeah. but yeah, I can immediately tell if somebody is speaking Spanish or Portuguese. Interesting. Even though a lot of words are in common. How the hell do you? How the hell do you? 
somebody else that was on the show a couple weeks back had a similar experience to this, and I still don't understand how the hell you memorize a song in a language you don't speak, like what that process is like. So when I was in school, um, German was my favorite language to sing in, and um, there are a couple of things in play. Number one, repetition. You practice a lot. You just do it over and over again. And But that alone doesn't do the trick. You have to really tear apart the, uh, the phrases and know with a word-by-word translation what you're saying. Mm. And if you don't, you can't remember. It's just sounds. You need to know the translation. Oh, yeah. Okay, interesting. Not only you need to know what every single word is, even if, because usually these languages are not like English you wouldn't put the words together in the same way. Mm -hmm. But um, if you understand each word that you're singing and how they fit together in that phrase, you can remember it years later. Hmm. It's, um, it it just will make sense. And there's a muscle memory. That's kind of what I'm talking about with the physicality of singing too. Um, that's starting to happen to me with the bossa novas. I, uh, now if I'm looking at the chart, I'm not looking at the words or thinking about what the word sounds like, because even though I might make mistakes, I, it's already kind of in my physicality, but, uh, I'm looking at the guitar chords, (laughs) trying to remember where to go next Mm. with the chart. So that process get like, is it, is it because it's music that it fits into your memory so much better? Yeah. So absolutely. Does, do you find that aiding in the learning of the language? Yes, absolutely. Hmm. Absolutely. I think as a musician, I'm better with the accent uh, than a lot of people would be. But uh, as an older adult, I should have started this when I was a child to, to hmm. be able to uh, be good at the language. I, I feel like my uh, verb conjugations are really, really lacking and... Um, I make lots of mistakes in grammar. Mm. So, I mean, my grandmother's been here since the like '40s or some shit, '50s maybe, and uh, she still pieces together English after all this time. Where's but she from? She's from Cuba. Oh, but uh, she, you know, like who gives a shit about grammar as long as the idea gets across? Sometimes, you know, that's true. Yeah, I've uh, met more and more Brazilians around North Carolina and. Uh, I am usually able to carry on a conversation. And I'm at the point now to where if I don't understand what they're saying, I can intelligently ask them, <laughs> mm. what does that word mean? Or yeah. so I don't know. I'm yeah. getting there. It's, it's a process. That's very cool. I think there's some joke about the word Brazilian, like, like how many, how many Brazilians are in the area? Like, Oh, a Brazilian of them. Something ah. like that. <laughs> That's bad. <laughs> <laughs> Horrible joke. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah. So I want to go back to this thing about the song. Mm-hmm. I don't know exactly how to phrase the question, but it's something like, I want to know if there's a difference for the singer in the relationship to the song from one, maybe like style or approach to art than another. And like, if when you're doing a song, like, like what you did at the show, that song that I remember that's like um, about being strong, about not being... Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. That, Jesse Winchester song. Yeah. That's what makes you strong. Yeah. That song versus a song in a different language versus like a, a something that's opera or something that's like a totally different style. Are you relating to all of those songs in the same exact way or in in uh, in different ways? My first thought was in the same way. I might be making a different sound, but, um, or, I mean, each song is an interpretation. Mm -hmm. So in that way, it's all different because I'm not going to sing in an opera voice on a Jesse Winchester song. (laughs) But it's it's not about that. It's about the um, interpretation of the song and... um, that comes from your heart (laughs) yeah and I guess when you think about it it's it's probably different from song to song yeah it's not maybe maybe it isn't about style to style so much as song to song yeah and I do think a little different I 
I produce a different voice for different songs, but actually, I think that's changing too. I think I'm becoming more um, myself, whatever that means, no matter what I'm singing anymore. I think I did that more when I was younger. Mm. Like if I was singing jazz, I had this voice, and if I was singing more folky, I would sing in a different voice. But I, they're blending together now in a way that uh, that they didn't. And I think that's a good thing. I, I think um, I'm not putting on as much as I used to. Yeah. That sounds like it would be a good thing. Mm-hmm. Putting on, I mean, like, do you think did the different styles of music that you were trained in, like, did that, was that required of that whole thing? Mm-hmm. Definitely. I mean, yeah. you don't want, you definitely want to make the sound that's appropriate for classical singing uh, or, um, I mean, that's just how it's done. Yeah. And so you're kind of shedding in just more broadly in all music, like you're kind of shedding that approach. Is that, what is that? Yeah. It still, if, if uh, somebody asks me to sing the Lord's Prayer at their wedding, I'm not going to do it in a folky style. I'm going to sing in my straight up classical voice because uh-huh. that's what's appropriate for that song. So, yeah. Hmm. The- and I'm not going to put on uh, a bunch of vibrato for uh, a folk song. Mm-hmm. And I, I naturally have a lot of vibrato, but I, I try and, you know, I don't take it all out because I want to sound like uh, high lonesome. Um, yeah. But I don't put more in. I don't know. The folk, the, like the folk side, mm-hmm. is it like, is it how, is it, is it like your natural sound? Yeah, that's an interesting question because what is natural? I mean, yeah. when I was a child, I didn't sing in an operatic voice, although I kind of did because I thought it was funny mm. <laughs> with my <laughs> girlfriends, you know? Yeah. And, uh. But I never, you know, I, I was just imitating things that I heard. Um, but I also had a vibrato as a pretty young child, mm-hmm. which is a little bit of a weird thing. But um, so the idea of taking it out is it's not it's physically hard for me to do. Yeah. Yeah. I think you asked the right question. Like, what is natural? Because it's not like it's not like in folk music, like. I guess in some cases you can imagine that some people almost use their speaking voice as like right. their instrument. And I can, mm-hmm. I can think of singers who come to mind that they sound almost that natural. One I might think be of Joan Baez. She, she had more of a head voice. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, one, uh, an artist that came to mind is like Riley Boggess. Mm-hmm. He, he sounds like Riley when he sings, you know, absolutely. It's like, the, there's not a lot of, obvious effort to be like oh i'm gonna make my voice sound like how folk music is supposed to sound or whatever right but of course there's a ton of that there's like there's there's singers do you know tim erickson no he's got a very i think ozark approach where you know he sings he sings like his voice is a violin Hmm. um you know you got people that sing like they're from kentucky that have they they just use a certain point a certain shape in their like vocal cords or whatever and uh it's not like everything in folk music is just purely, you know, like without inspiration. Right. That's like what it looks like, I think, a lot of the time. It mm-hmm. looks like it's just humans in their natural form that just happen to be making music. But really, there's a lot of pageantry and tradition and yeah. costumes and all sorts of shit right. going on in folk music. Right. Yeah. I think of your voice as being very close to your natural speaking voice. I'd like it to be, I think, but... It didn't start out that way, that's for sure. I mean, I think I, the similar process that you've gone through, I, I didn't have to learn how to not be operatic, but I mm-hmm. did have to learn how to... Actually, you know what? No, I'd have to, I might have to say it's the opposite direction. I think it started out too close to my um, speaking voice, where mm-hmm. really it was just it louder and with no grace. And I really <laughs> had to learn how to find it and be more graceful and like soft with it, you know? Yeah. Because hearing this... Yeah, throw out a song. <laughs> right, like a little, right. Uh, yeah, there's an artistry. There's an artistry, yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, we all, we're all going through the same thing. We just have different styles. Yeah, and different starting places and different mm-hmm. authorities, too, you know. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. That, that's true. Like, when you were talking about the quality of the song, that's, the, that's what the word that came to mind was, like, 
thinking about like, well, what makes a song good according to the person who's trying to figure out if it's good or not? Like, is it if it fits a tradition that says, well, this is what good music sounds like? Or is it if you feel good about it? Or is it if it's fucking sounds like your speaking voice? Like, what is the... What is the measuring stick? So do you, are you talking about the, the specific songs themselves? Just this, yeah, whatever. I guess all I mean is f- me, you, Colin, Kike, a bunch of people could sit in this room and say, this song is good. But the question is, what is the, for every person, you know, more like a statement. The statement is that for every person, obviously that perspective on what the authority is that makes a song good is probably quite a bit different. Oh, yeah. And... I think we should just throw that question out the window. I think it has more to do with who sounds good on what song. Mm. Mm. Um, because I may not sound good on the same songs that you do. Right. And uh, I don't know. I'll, I'll, I pick songs uh, for a variety of reasons. I love sad songs. Uh, it's funny that you say that I'm always smiling. <laughs> but... Um, <laughs> And I try not to, you know, bombard people with sad songs, but I would prefer to sing them all day long. <laughs> yeah. Because I, I just think there's so much more, uh, I don't know, I love the emotion yeah. in, in sad songs, and I, I love mm. uh, expressing that. But it's also fun to sing, um, what did Emmy Lou Harris say, uh, zippity doo dah songs. <laughs> You know, I think she was saying it disparagingly, but yeah. <laughs> but those songs are fun to sing too. I love that. <laughs> yeah, ah, uh, man, I have I have a question that's a good one, but uh, uh, I I had a thought I wanted to stick with. Maybe I lost it. I may have lost it. So <laughs> we can just switch modes to that. Like I want to talk about. I wanted to ask you what some of your favorite like sad songs are. Like what comes to mind, and I feel like it could be. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'll just leave it at that. I need to. Simplify. Well, uh, instead of a song, I'll just say a person. Mm. Um, Lucinda Williams. Oh, sure. <laughs> I mean, I love singing Blue. That's one of my favorite songs to sing. And I don't know that song. Um, yeah, you do. Blue Ooh. is the color of night. I think maybe. Um, let's see another. Uh, Minneapolis is a song of hers that is just... <sighs> um... One of my good friends was recently like, uh, I didn't want to admit that I, I haven't listened to Lucinda as much as I should have. She was one of, on the early side of when I used to pirate music uh-huh. and I was like looking through a bunch of, uh, acoustic music by like, by like Ray LaMontagne and this Canadian guy named Jeremy Fisher and people like that. And she was in that mix. And I had like, I had her on some of my earliest CDs of acoustic Americana stuff, but I haven't. I haven't really like kept up with her as much as I probably should have. Well, there's there's so many artists out there. Is we all have our uh, formative. I mean, when I got Car Wheels on a Gravel Road, I just listened to it nonstop for a year. <laughs> so, yeah. um, what is it when it comes to the songs that you find that you love to kind of curate and develop into your own performance thing? Like, what is there a particular thing that they might have in common? Or is it like, like, how do you know which songs are the ones that you'd love to share with people as your own, like an extension of you and your performance and shit? Um, I don't know if I can answer that. I, I think of, you know, my first thought was that, uh, things that fit well in my voice, but it's also about the content. And I think about songs that I have doggedly sung for years that, I'm probably not all that great at, but I love the song so much that I keep trying to make it mine. Mm. And um, so um, regardless of the genre, uh, you know, I'm thinking about classical music and jazz music and uh, folk or country or pop music there is usually some emotion that I feel when I sing it that I, I feel like I can somehow channel. Mm-hmm. And um, so I think that's where it comes from. And sometimes they fit my voice better than others, but there are, there are just songs that I'm really drawn to that, um, yeah. that I just can't let go of. 
And believe me, I know how difficult of a question I've thrown at you because I like <laughs> I couldn't I don't know how I would answer that question either. Uh, there is a there's a really magical element to it all that's really hard to explain. Mm-hmm. That is like, I mean, I, I you know going song by song, I can talk about why I love certain songs that right. I cover or whatever. But um, yes, there's something I remember once. And this is how fickle and how delicate it is. One, like uh, I used to do a Flame and Lips song called uh, Waiting for Superman. Mm-hmm. And I would do it. And I just had this fucking like, uns- like unspoken, unaddressed knowledge that whatever experience I was having with the people in that room, it was something scary. And it was something like that we all felt. And, and I never had to acknowledge it and after the set like people would mention that song to me and be like that was a special moment and we just knew and then one time I like tried to do that song as a duet with someone or whatever and it just after that I was like wow I don't have that power anymore like Mm -hmm. I don't I that song doesn't have the same power anymore and I don't know how to explain that I took it to some place where it shattered this power that it had you know and uh that's the best language I can put around that. So like, you retired it. I retired. I pretty mm-hmm. much retired it. Like I can, <clears throat> I can pull it out, but it doesn't have that same thing, that same mysterious sort of uh, trance that it puts people in, you know. And whatever that is, is often why I choose songs. Yeah. I don't know how to explain that. It's just it has a certain power to it that is kind of unique. When, that that I can take the song that seriously or mm-hmm. something. I think sometimes uh, it, it has to do with who who is in my band. Mm. Um, I love singing with Sarah Howell Miller, and uh, there are certain songs that if she's not there, I just don't want to sing it because <laughs> I feel like the magic is in how our voices lock together. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, because I don't always have the same ensemble every time I'm performing. So, um, and I do tend to think vocally. Yeah. So I'm hearing the vocals more than anything else, but, uh, and I, I don't, uh, unlike you, I don't perform solo very often. Mm, Yeah. It's, it's less common for me. Yeah. So it's more about who I'm working with and, uh, how we are putting it together so yeah yeah I'm way more I have songs that I do solo that are just like I have a rule for myself that is just like that's a solo song Mm -hmm. and you just don't do that with other people or something and it's that's but be but performing solo is kind of like my it's one of my strengths or whatever Mm -hmm. and uh it's just kind of a different thing it's probably kind of like I mean hell it's probably Oh, we're getting rain. I saw that. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably like it's probably like you, uh, part of the I I don't know probably part of uh, your strength with ensembles or something like it's just a different take on things. But uh, yeah, it's interesting how how those songs find us and uh, and what we find in them or whatever. Yeah, and it it does change over time. I mean, uh, songs that I did ten years ago may not have the magic now that they had then yeah um so i don't know but so why sad songs do you think like there that's a special thing in its own separate from zippity doo dah songs and it is quite interesting some people i know they like i'll show them shit of mine and they're just like god like or shit i like and they're like god like why are you always about all these like horribly sad songs and it really seems to affect some people in a way that they're like i don't want that right and some people can't get enough of it and like what is it for you what like what is it for you that makes that a positive thing I guess I think it's uh, they tend to be slower Mm -hmm. and uh it's a way of engaging your body in this music and sometimes it's not even about the content of the lyrics um Sometimes it's just a chord progression that you can just sink into and lean into and um, interact with vocally um, 
Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. It, it's um, it's just a sound and a feeling that uh, maybe the words aren't even that good, but it feels good to sing it. Mm-hmm. And there might just be one phrase or one word within that song that uh, you can express in a way that feels totally unique to you. And that's what makes that song worth doing. Mm. And if anybody else can hear that, then that's a huge triumph. And if they can't, you still really (laughs) felt good doing it. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, my mom hates slow songs and uh, she's always like, well, I like it when you do the upbeat stuff. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You know what we should do is do a project of just all really upbeat, but like horribly depressing lyrics. There are a lot of them out there. Yeah. We should do a, we should do a medley. Uh, (laughs) What, do you know what this, what is the saddest song in the world? I don't know if I can answer that. Um, I'm trying to th- sit here thinking, like, what are some of the saddest songs ever? So I I used to do this Dar Williams song all the time that everybody said, that's, that's the saddest song ever, and it's called February. And I heard the song as um, the sad ending of a relationship and moving on to a new relationship, but it was, it was just the sadness of here I am going through the motions of this. And um, when I sang it, people would come up to me and they felt like the song was about dementia. Hmm. And it touched them so deeply because they saw their mothers or fathers in the song. And I never wow. heard it that way. Yeah. And that song became very powerful from uh from that standpoint so you just never know how what you're singing affects how it affects other people um a song that i did a long time ago called way up on the mountain um that was written by uh, my bandmate uh, keith buckner and he wrote it for me uh, based on things that i had said about growing up in west virginia but other people I remember a woman coming up to me saying that song was so meaningful to me because it just like helped helped me get through my divorce. Mm. And it's not a song about divorce, or at least it wasn't written that way. But you really don't, once a song is out in the world, you don't have any control of uh, how it affects people and what it means to people. And I think that's so beautiful. That's the sign of a good song where it can um, touch people in ways that were never intended. Yeah, I love that. You got any lines? I'm curious about this February song. You got any lines from that that kind um, of describe what it's a, how it how it functions as a work? Yeah, it's right in the middle. Let's see if I can jump mentally to the middle of the song. Um, the last line is. Uh, We've gathered all our arms can carry. It's talking about gathering wood for the fire. Uh, I have lost to February. But there's a, a line in the middle. Um, you stopped and you pointed and you said, that's a flower. And I said, what's a flower? Oh. Yeah. So it's, is. it's really. Yeah. What I love about shit like that is like, the specifics that's what's so great about writing is like the specifics of human experiences that like get they they're so they're such a portrait in time you know mm-hmm. like and we maybe we won't all experience that in that same way but there's something weird about poetry where we, you can you can take a phrase like that and it'll still evoke in me some kind of memory that that rem, that is reminded that that I'm reminded of because of that picture for yeah. some fucked up reason right um, right. That's a real, it's, I love, I love sentimental shit and that's just a. I do too. Yeah. I do too. I think, and I think that's a very American thing. Not that other uh, peoples don't have that, but yeah, I think we really milk that mm-hmm. <laughs> in a beautiful way. Father John Misty, like last year sometime said about music when he was kind of releasing his newest thing. Um, 
he said he believed that the difference between entertainment and art was that entertainment makes you forget about your life and art reminds you of your life. Mm, I love that. I do too. That's really good. Yeah, that's really fucking good. Yeah. He's pretty smart. Um, that's amazing. Yeah, sometimes sad songs for me, it's like it's not sad. I remember like as a kid, and you, you know the old joke about country music, if you play it backwards or whatever. Do you know this joke? No. If you, <laughs> if you, I can't wait to hear. If you play country music backwards, what do you get? You get your dog back. Oh, you get yeah, your yeah, truck yeah. Back, you know. <laughs> right. You know, that's like the the stereotype, I guess, of what you yeah. think of as sad music. Oh, woe is me. I got divorced to know, like, oh, she took the house or whatever the fuck. But, like, to me, I mean, sad shit. But to, I mean, and, and I, Tom Waits is someone I bring up a lot, and I hate how much I bring him up, but he's just such a prolific writer mm-hmm. and so profound, and, and, like, he inspires me a lot. And some of his song, like he has this song called Kentucky Avenue. Have you ever heard this? No. Oh my God. It's so simply, it's not, it shouldn't be sad, but it's like from the perspective of this kid who's talking to this other kid. Uh, and he goes through this litany of just like strange observations and details about like what they're, what they can do as kids mm-hmm. in this place. Uh, they can, climb on top of the roof of the drugstore and maybe like, you know, go to the junkyard and see some cars that have bullet holes in them or something. But there's this moment that like changes everything for me that the, the, the music like, boom, it just like lifts up, gets really beautiful. And he says, uh, he says, I'll take the spokes from your wheelchair and a magpie's wings and I'll bury them tonight out in the cornfield. Hmm. Like, and then I get this strange image in my head of like there's this these unfortunate kids that are just like begging to do something. And the song ends with uh, we'll we'll jump on a train, we'll ride the train all the way to New Orleans in the fall or something like that. Just such simple poetry. But what's sad about it is like these two kids that that so desperately want to like ride a train off to some other place and, and escape the reality of a wheelchair. That's yeah. sad. Right. It's real fucking sad. It sure is. It's a deeper level of sad, I guess, than like, woe is me. Yeah. yeah. And great songwriters, uh, I mean, that that evoked images for me of my childhood, not that right. I had those. Uh, it touches all of us in an individual way, but John Prine does that. I mean, he's the master. Hello in there. I know. Such simple <laughs> words. Oh my no fancy words in any of his songs and they're, they're all so artful mm-hmm. so artful sam fraser does have you heard him do hello in there i have oh yes he does it beautifully yeah. and with his raspy voice it's just perfect it's, I mean, yeah. so one thing that i did uh on my last record that uh the song hallelujah the leonard cohen song hallelujah mm-hmm. um i always felt like it was you know, it's overdone. Everybody does it, and I didn't really want to do it. I had learned it because, you know, somebody who had cancer and was kind of having their last birthday party asked me to sing it at their party, and this was like over 10 years ago, and that was really hard, and that infused such meaning into that song, but then people started asking me to do it, and um and I had uh, such mixed feelings about putting it on a record because it's it's so cliche, but it meant so much mm-hmm. to so many people that I knew personally yeah. that I felt like I had to do that. And um, so there's that side of these songs too. Yeah. Uh, where do you, how do you choose things? That <laughs> yeah, that's cool. That's like a, such a such a behind the scenes thing that so many people would never know about, like the relationship to the song right and yeah uh yeah it's it's hor- it can be horribly sad those moments uh i've had I've, I've had some conversations with friends one of the most surreal uh experiences i've had of that nature was i got uh got a phone call <clears throat> from some friends who said you know this person who used to come to your shows all the time uh just died of cancer or whatever. And apparently the whole time she was like in the hospital 
she was listening to me. Oh. I was like, what? So her family called and asked if I would play the funeral. You know, oh. you know I won't even, I won't even, the song that, that was chosen, you know, was a meaningful song for the occasion. And it's one that is so, uh, it's such a, I'll just name the song, what the fuck, it, it doesn't matter. But anyway, they wanted me to do, um, You Raised Me Up by Josh Groban. Right. And, you know, for all of us, for, you know, it's like Josh Groban, that's, he's a weird, right. weird artist. Like he's in the classical sort of like, almost like Celine Dion. Yeah, that's a weird thing to ask you to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a weird. But I bet it was amazing. Even as artists, it's like, <laughs> it, I don't know. It's just like, is Josh Groban a cool <clears throat> artist or is he like mainstreaming for like, for, for like really, really like straight edge, like intellectual people or something, you know? And, but regardless of that, it's just like for that song is a powerful song and like, mm -hmm. it, it meant a lot in that occasion. And like it, it gave it like now that song has a whole different context in my life than just being like a Josh Groban song, you know? Yeah. Yeah, we have to let let go of our coolness sometimes and <laughs> do our jobs, That's exactly right. which is touching people with music. That's exa exactly right. Even even with, yeah, I still have quite a problem with. I don't know if you relate to this, but I still have a problem with um, understanding whether a performance is for me or for them. The answer is yes. <laughs> And I've thought a lot about that because um, it can't touch them if it if it doesn't touch you. And I know that I just contradicted myself from you know, quit your coolness and just do your job. <laughs> well, yeah. that's part but there is a balance that's part there. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, I don't do everything that's requested of me, but. Um, so I'll go back to classical music days and uh, a competition that I was in. And I chose um, for the final round an, uh, an operatic Italian piece that I thought the judges wanted to hear. Mm -hmm. But it really didn't showcase me very well. And I, I'm more of a lyric. I'm better at the... Um, the long lines and the expressiveness than I am at the hopping around on the different notes and being gymnastic yeah. as a singer. And uh, so my teacher after that said, well, why did you choose that song? And, and I said, well, I, th I thought it would be more like what they wanted to hear as my final song. And uh, she said, do you like that song? And I said, not really, but and she said, don't ever choose songs that you don't love. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've always remembered that. Yeah. So, great you know, sometimes I have to sing something that I don't love. But uh, in general, if there's a song on my uh, set list, it's there because at, at least at some point I loved it. That's, yeah, that's tough because you don't, like, they're, they're, I, I, there, I've written a lot of songs, and some of them I definitely loved at one point. And, <laughs> and some of them, this is a new development for me, I guess, because I'm trying to be better about appreciating that, that there are people that come to my shows that love certain songs of mine that like want, they, they'd be thrilled to hear them. And even if I don't, even if it's not like super pressing for me to do it that night, like it would really mean a lot to them to hear that song. Right. I appreciate that more now than I ever have before, but I really do. I fall out of love with a lot of my songs as mm -hmm. time goes on. I mean, they're, it's like, I mean, when you think about it, it's like a goddamn like snapshot of me when I was 25. Right. Thinking about things that mattered to me and looked a certain way when I was 25 and now being 33, it's like, that's a, that was a long time ago. That was a different mm -hmm. person that yeah. wrote that song, and it can be so hard to like maintain that belief in that song. You yeah, know? I get it. Because it, that's what it is. It seems like, in a way, is like belief, a belief mm -hmm. that this song is expressing something. You know. Yeah. But it's like James Taylor. I think you know. He he said, "I never get tired of singing." Uh, Shower the people. People want to hear that song. I guess so. So 
I would get tired of singing <laughs> the same songs all the time. I would too. I would too. Um, yeah. Yeah. Last, last thing about this, but yeah. Part of the reason I asked if it was for me or for, for us or for them, you know, it's like this week I played uh, Whitewater Center in Charlotte. Mm-hmm. It was really pleasant. It was really nice. Beautiful place. Big stage. Everything should have been great. Uh, there's probably 500 people there. I mean, wow. it was like, it was pretty awesome. It was Labor Day weekend, so yeah. it was like fucking packed. Wow. Um, we did two sets. First set, this guy was like throwing Frisbee around with some kids and throwing a football around and stuff. Like close to the stage in an area where it was probably a little bit obnoxious for some people, but it wasn't that big of a deal. Mm-hmm. We take a break. As we're taking a break, all these kids kind of gather right in front of the stage and start playing volleyball and stuff. And, you know, that's fun to watch. But then when I was about to go back on stage, I was like, it occurred to me that this could be an issue. Yeah. And I said to the sound man, like, is there something we could do about that? And he was like, no. (laughs) Like, no, uh, there's not. And I was like, okay, all right. So we take to the stage and kind of chilling and. The kids didn't like them. I main, my main concern was like, is that thing going to fly on stage or not? And it, mm-hmm. I was starting to get the vibe that it wasn't. But then that same guy that was like throwing Frisbee and shit, he starts throwing football with these kids again, oh. but he's throwing football like toward the stage oh. and the kids are like running in front of the stage to catch the ball. And I'm like, not just insulted at what this does to the whole evening, but yeah. I have a ball flying toward the stage while I'm like listening playing to guitar. guys and playing guitar yeah. and singing words. And I just found myself like really aggravated and trying to decide, do I get on the mic and say, hey, to anybody who is throwing footballs toward the stage, maybe stop doing that. Or do I just say to myself, you know, this is their venue. This is their weekend. I have to I have to step back a little bit. And I, I decided to go with that, but I, it took me deciding that like the integrity of the show was less than their experience. Yeah. You needed chicken wire in front of the stage no kidding. <laughs> at that point. I did. It's like a, a beer bottle being thrown. It in. is, which I'm not a rockabilly band. <laughs> right. So it's like a little, it's not the best thing. Yeah. But yeah, I mean like in a situation like that, I have a really hard time deciding that like their experience is more valuable than necessarily my experience of it like I hate performing in a, in a way that makes me feel like it what I'm doing is unimportant mm-hmm. you know yes I know it's uh, I've uh, played lots of parties and that's a that's a totally different thing than p- playing um, a concert if you're playing a concert and people are talking loudly Uh, that is, um, that's hard for everybody, the people who are there to listen to you. And I've also been at parties where people come up and apologize for all the noise. And I'm like, no, 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 it's a party. Yeah. They're, they're having fun and I'm doing my job. They're doing their job. It's all good. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's knowing what situation is, what are the right things to do in what situations? Yeah. I think. Well, that's, you know, that was probably the main thing I love so much about your show was just the opportunity. Like it, it was, like I said at the beginning, just music there was treated like something special. And that honestly is, in my view, like that I think is what we're lacking the most with this whole shift that's taking place with mm-hmm. the internet, with streaming, with like where performance is, where music is in general. Music honestly doesn't feel special a lot of the time and especially when it's not presented like it is special it's hard for it to feel special but um that was like such that was part of the huge honor it was to do the show because it was just like beautiful theater beautiful everything treated like it fucking mattered thank you so much we uh we care (laughs) we really (laughs) care but it's i don't i don't know the show is it feels like the most important thing I've ever done. Mm. And, um, and I didn't know that going into it. I, um, I didn't know what it was going to turn into and I still don't know what it's going to turn into. I I hope I can keep doing it for a long time. It's uh, a ton of work. It's expensive. And, you know, we're, we just, we love it so much and we want to 
keep building this community of musicians and uh, listeners and I would love to take it national if we can figure out how to do that. I'm hell yeah. I'm working on that now, and uh, you know, I am not a business person, so it's really hard for me to go out and say, "Hey, support what we're doing," because I mean, this is amazing. <laughs> there's other shows that have done it, and like I think yours is on up there in the run. Like I don't see why it wouldn't be, you know, fit for that market. I mean, I think it's perfect. for I it. feel that too, and I and. Um, and it's because of this amazing team and all of the amazing artists in our area. And yes, we have national artists that come through, but it is the local and regional artists who, that have really been the backbone of the show. And that's what it's that's where the sound comes from, and that's what it's all about. And I think that's going to be attractive to anybody in the country, anybody in the world. Mm. I feel I really believe in the music of our region and our specific sound Mm. i love that you said that i love that you said that the music of our region i want to ask one more question i guess like and maybe you can attach it to that phrase which i found i find really interesting you also talked about this show being important like feeling important and i guess like maybe you can just elaborate on that like if uh, is it is it that you do you understand the mission of this thing or what, what is the importance, I guess, of that? And of ma- even if you want of sharing the music of our region out there with the, the national market. Yeah. Uh, I have different ways of answering that question. Um, so try and keep me on track. <laughs> I don't want to go off. Um, the importance. So my mission at the beginning of this was to uh, give a platform for as many women as men. I wanted to, I wanted the programming to reflect uh, the fact that as a woman in music, I see the rosters of festivals that I've played or uh, concert series that I've done, and uh, I've been maybe the one woman or one of two or three women. And um, we're like the token women. And there's so many women out there. And, but a, I know that a lot of women don't go into music who are very, very talented because it's just too hard. There are fewer slots for us. So um, from the beginning, that's what I, I wanted to do. And I, I wanted some um, variety because I am a person who can't seem to stick to one thing stylistically. Mm. And that has been to my detriment when it comes to, you know, I'm kind of unbookable for an agency because like, what is it that I do? I don't know. I have a hard time telling people what I do. Like this show is jazz. This show is Americana. I don't know. Mm. Um, I wanted to bring uh like all my set lists in the past have been really mixed up genre wise and that's becoming more and more common for people but um you know 15 20 years ago that was uh, a difficult sell mm. and um but audiences who enjoyed my shows would always say we like that you do different types of music so i might not be reaching the jazz crowd or the folk crowd or the Americana crowd because I'm giving so much variety, but I believe in that format. So I wanted to put together a show that uh, had interesting artists. So it's not me doing all of those things. And I love that I can bring in a singer songwriter, um, an opera singer. um, I don't know. uh, Uh, a rock and roll band mm-hmm. and whatever they're not doing, that's what I do that night. <laughs> and that's fun yeah. for me because I can program myself according to <laughs> what everybody else is not doing. Yeah. And I, I love the creative process of putting together groupings of people. Yeah. And um, so if you don't like this singer songwriter in eight minutes, there will be something completely different that, you know, you will probably like. Yeah. So um, part of it is that I, I love that format. 
But as an individual artist, I will say selfishly that this has enabled me to um, to do something that works for me more than uh, I. I never know where I fit, mm-hmm. and so I don't really have to fit in any one big thing, and I don't. Uh, I don't have to go tour and. Um, find an agency who can deal with my thing that doesn't fit. So I don't know. I'm kind of creating my own lane in that way too. So personally that has been really gratifying to me as an artist because (laughs) what else, you know, when you don't, when you don't work Mm -hmm. everywhere, it's, it's better to just create your own thing so that you're, you're not just angry that people don't understand your thing. I think it's certainly better to not fit everywhere or to not fit in perfectly, you know, when. Unless you're trying to make a living. Yeah. <laughs> That's where it's. Uh, it can. It's But, tricky. I mean, I don't know. I do believe. I think there's a lot of cynicism and stuff. and Not not what you've expressed. Right. My, I fight my own cynicism about mm-hmm. how easy it is to be like the mainstream. They don't reward creativity. Right. They want to formulate everything into like whatever boiled down shit. But when I hear, uh, what was his name? Sam Smith. I don't know Sam Smith. Is that his name? I don't think that's his name. When I hear the guy that did that stay with me song, the British guy. Oh yeah. 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 I don't know his name either, but I know that song. His voice is super fucking unique. Yeah. Um, true. You know, Tom Waits has been rewarded by the industry. He's super fucking unique. John Prine, Mm -hmm. Johnny Cash in his day. Of course, he was abandoned by the industry and all that shit. But like the point is that the the dream of art, of uniqueness, I think really does exist in the world. I think uniqueness within the arts truly is rewarded in a Mm -hmm. lot of ways. Um, It is a harder sell, yes. And it's harder to get people to understand what you're doing, but... I, I, when I hear you talk about that, about like all the variety that there is, the fact that you decided instead of, instead of simplifying and saying, okay, I just need, I need this shit to be simple. I'm just going to be a jazz singer and just do jazz songs or whatever. I'm glad that you've created your own way instead of, uh, instead of simplifying yourself. Thank you. Thank you. Um, talking about that North Carolina sound too, we are all so affected by that. I'm from West Virginia, but I, my formative years in music have been in North Carolina, and uh, the musicians that I've worked with here, uh, when I say North Carolina sound, you know as well as I do that that is mm-hmm. uh, very wide. There, there are a lot of genres represented. Um, and when you talk about, when you ask about the, the mission of the show, um, that has been something that has grown as we've gone along, and I have gained more of an understanding of that myself, how um, the power of this format to reflect this area. Mm-hmm. And I might have intellectually thought it at the beginning, but now I feel it and I see it, and it really has grown into um, a family of musicians. I have worked with so many people that I would never have been able to because as individual artists, we don't get that opportunity to, we might meet people, but yeah, to really work with people in, um, in a concrete way, making music, even if like, I didn't sing with you on the show, but I feel like I have a, mm-hmm. a much clearer understanding of your music than I would have if we hadn't worked that closely. Yeah, for sure. So, um, So in that way, this show represents, let's say I lost my voice tomorrow and couldn't sing anymore. Mm -hmm. I could still do this show. (laughs) Yeah. I just don't have to sing. Mm -hmm. I could still um, have these great relationships and fulfill the mission of this show. So it, it's really cool that uh, the pressure is off of me. It's not about, it's not all about me, even though my name is on the show. It's really not. It's, uh, it's about something so much bigger. And that's why I think that this show should be nationally syndicated. Yep. (laughs) And I can say that without feeling weird about it. Absolutely. I mean, you shouldn't feel weird about it. You know, I think uh, when your name is on there and when you're 
when you have this vision rolling forward, it makes all the sense in the world that you would believe in it. And, yeah, and, and I do. I, I do really too. Do. And uh, I think it would be amazing to see that happen. So I hope, I truly hope it does. Um, Thank you. And honestly, like you've been, you have been part of what has inspired an idea that I've been trying to continue to formulate here. Hmm. I'm more like interested in going online and thinking about how to get people to watch these video, like watch the pod, listen to the podcast and yeah. Like what I would love is you come over today and you and I have an opportunity to make some music and document that and share that, you know, like that's my take on this whole thing. Uh, and yeah, so you've been a, you've been an inspiration in that way. And I, I hope that Thank whatever, you, I hope that that truly does continue to grow for you and for you. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think on that very positive and communal note, <laughs> <laughs> I guess we'll call it a day. All right. Uh, hey, thank you for coming over and thank you for having me on your show it was a pleasure being here and having you on the, on my show too hell thank yeah you. well <laughs> till next time yes boom <laughs> boom